Star Citizen is definitely a game that has seen a lot of controversy in recent history. A lot of people have said that it's a scam, it'll never come out, and uh, it's too expensive, only a supercomputer can run it. And I can see where those people are coming from, but as a prospective backer of Star Citizen, it sure must be confusing to you to hear contradictory statements like, it's a great game, you should back it. And so in this video, I'm going to try to help you cut through that BS and help you make that decision for yourself based on some as unbiased as possible information about the game. I'm going to do that in several ways. The first way is to answer some very common questions, for in fact. The first question is, what is Star Citizen? The second, what is Star Citizen at the moment, as in, what is the current state of the game? Third, what do you need to run the game, as in, what PC hardware are you looking at needing? And then finally, how much do you really need to pay to enjoy the game? The answer to which you probably will find to be quite surprising. Finally, at the end, I'll give you my own opinion about why I chose to back the game at concierge level. And for those of you who don't know, that means that I've already backed over a thousand US dollars. So without further introduction, let's just get started with the first question. So to really answer the question about what Star Citizen actually is, I first need to go into a really boring subject, and I'll do it very quickly, and that's how the game is being funded. Chris Roberts started the game in 2012 as a Kickstarter, uh, with the goal of creating basically a spiritual successor to his Freelancer and Wing Commander series. Now it's not important that you guys know what those series are, all you have to know is that his goal was to create the best science fiction MMO possible. In order to accomplish these goals, he, he realized he couldn't go through the traditional channels that a lot of development studios go through to get their games published, that's going through big publishing houses like EA or Activision. Because from his perspective, the industry's direction was putting too much of a hamper on the scope of games. It, it, it basically restricted his creative freedom too much. And at this point in 2018, we can really see that he wasn't too far off point there with the direction of the industry. I mean, you look now at what's happened with EA and the Star Wars franchise. They've essentially ruined it with their Battlefront 1 and 2 installations that are incredibly shallow for a huge price, and they even tried to shove microtransactions in our face, which started this whole thing about loot boxes being banned everywhere. Good job, EA. I'm sure all of your friends love you. And then Activision bought Blizzard, and Blizzard's now losing its soul. So I don't think that he was wrong, and in fact, I think it shows incredible foresight for him to seek alternative funding methods such as crowdsourcing. Finally, he said this was a great way to connect directly with the people who would be playing the game, something that they've maintained to this day. But how does this really affect the way Star Citizen is made? How does it really make it different than, say, games produced by EA or Activision? Well, according to Chris Roberts, it's enabled him to do a lot more detailed things than would otherwise be possible. One of the examples he gave in his initial Kickstarter video was how Star Citizen simulates the way ships move uh, more realistically than any other space game by actually simulating each individual thruster which creates a thrust vector for the ship. Now what this enables is actually really fantastic and dynamic handling characteristics when you blow off a ship's thruster. You can actually target specific areas of a ship to make it handle in a way that you want to say capture it for example or make it so that it can't stop. These are the sorts of gameplays that going to this level of detail enables. This philosophy of not trying to fake systems but actually trying to fully simulate them scales to a lot of different facets of the game, which is enabling some really interesting and unforeseen gameplay. For example, instead of having you go out and actually drag and drop cargo into your cargo through like a text box system, you actually have to go out and physically grab it. What this means is that, say for example, somebody sneaks on board your ship, they could grab a box of say gold and just jump off while you're not paying attention. And yes, both of these things are currently in the game. The other way that they're trying to make the game more immersive is through fidelity. And what does that really mean? So they're trying to push a lot of industry leading or completely new technologies that have never been seen before in the gaming world. Say for example, real-time simulated cloud tech so that they could have stuff like nebula and cloud covers and gas giants. 
The tools and tech that enable this sort of technology is really difficult and time consuming to make, but there's a real reason behind it. Not only does it set Star Citizen apart from a lot of the competition, but it actually allows for them to take in an alternative source of income by being able to license a lot of this new tech out to other companies. You see, this is another way to continually fund the game after, say, crowdsourcing begins to plateau. Now obviously, visual fidelity and detail in systems don't necessarily make you want to continually revisit the game. So what are they going to make in it that makes it so unique? What makes it the best science fiction MMO ever, according to Chris Roberts? Well, the idea is that you're going to be able to do anything you want. There's no artificial or arbitrary restrictions on what's possible. You can become any sort of trade or profession that you like. Roam the galaxy being Bubba Fett, bounty hunting people down, or be a trader merchantman that goes and sells rare wares at different planets, or be an explorer that finds new routes or planets and new technologies to sell to other people to make money, or join the military to fight the Vandul Swarm. It's your choice and there's no arbitrary skill point system or ranking or levels to stop you from doing what you want. In short, your skills are determined by you and what you're able to do, not some point system so that you know somebody who's been playing for forever can just kick the crap out of you when you come in because they've got a level 25 sword or some crap like that. The economy will also be dynamically controlled by both the players and by NPCs which are managed by CIG. And that's because they're trying to avoid overinflation or people specifically trying to dismantle the economy by buying up too many commodities or selling too many. Ultimately, it's supposed to be an enjoyable experience for everybody, for those uh, hardcore players and even those who are just casually jumping on and off the game. Beyond jobs and beyond fighting though, there's also other things that you'll be able to do. Much more peaceful things that you might not realize are something that you're really missing. Like being able to customize your ship with different colors, or being able to customize the interior of your captain's quarters, or your hab on a planet, or your, or your whole base on a planet for your guild, so that each space is individualized to yourself. I and mean, that really ties into the detail level that they're trying to get into the game. Well, that they're actually getting into the game. Being able to actively move around objects inside of a space to be able to make it your own. Kind of like what happened in SWG, Star Wars Galaxies. If you guys remember that game, you were able to do basically anything you wanted to decorate the interior of your home, and it made for some really great RP. Now, aside from the MMO part of the game, and if you guys have any more questions, feel free to ask down in the comment section below. There's also the aspect of the single player campaign, Squadron 42. Now, Squadron 42 is going to be a separate piece. Originally, it was part of Star Citizen. You would play through the campaign first, and then you'd be let off into the Star Citizen MMO world. But now, he decided to make it so that you could just choose one or the other. You didn't have to be part of Squadron 42 in order to enjoy the MMO. And the game is going to be a really well done full AAA title with a number of really famous people you've probably heard about. People like Mark Hamill from Star Wars or Gillian Anderson from The X-Files, Liam Cunningham, the guy who plays the Onion Knight in Game of Thrones, or how about Henry Cavill, the guy who plays Superman, a guy who apparently actually approached them about being part of Squadron 42, a fan of the game in his own right. All of this taking place in our own galactic backyard, the Milky Way. And whether it be in the campaign or in the MMO, you're going to make your own name for yourself through the universe. You can go it solo or you can go it with a group of friends. It's all up to you. It's all up to what sort of playstyle that you want to play. And really, I can keep going and going about it because obviously I'm really enthusiastic about Star Citizen, but I'm gonna stop right here because now it's time to start talking about what Star Citizen is today. But if this explanation wasn't good enough and you still have questions, feel free to comment down below or go check out their website at robertspaceindustries.com to learn more about the direction Star Citizen is going. But now let's get into what the current state of the game is. It can be best seen here on the roadmap page of the RSI website, which clearly shows what they're currently working on and what's coming in future patches. Lately, they've been keeping to a pretty good quarterly schedule since they started committing to it last year. As a result, we've seen a lot more progress in this past year than we've seen in the previous five. 
That really doesn't tell the whole story though, because a lot of the progress is owed to the fact that a lot of their core tech and tools have now come to a first iteration, with the exception of server meshing, which is going to enable extremely large server caps. The reason why this core tech is so important is because it was a blocker for creating the tangible content we've been waiting for. Stuff like object container streaming made Hurston the planet possible, a planet almost the size of Earth. It's a feature that helps your computer handle the amount of information that exists within the world of Star Citizen, bringing your frames from what used to be around 20 to 30 FPS without even a planet like Hurston to now 60 to 70 FPS anywhere in the system. With the exception of places like Lorville, which are currently waiting on their own unique city tech version of OCS. As of this moment in time, there's not a whole lot of content that's going to keep you in the game for a long period of time. The missions, the trading, the bounty hunting are all going to help you earn money and even buy ships in game. But because the persistence core tech part of the game isn't fully integrated, there's not persistence between patches. So unfortunately, every time a patch rolls around, your inventory gets wiped and it's kind of a hamper on the progress in game. Still though, people do find a lot of fun playing the game with their friends who who have different types of ships which they're able to borrow and try out or do multi-crew sorts of missions with and a lot of people like to create their own sort of missions where they fight against other players test to see which weapons work best or even do first person shooter matches in big ships like the hammerhead though i think the experience is quite subjective although there's not a lot of missions for me to do in the game i still find myself returning to it with my friends to do new shenanigans as new features are added into the game. Stuff like VoIP, vo uh, Face over IP and VoIP, Voice over IP have enabled us to have really fun encounters with other people who we don't know, and that in itself can be quite fun. Speaking of encounters with other players, the PvP and PvE on the first person combat side is also feeling really crisp and nice. A lot of people who like to play games like Escape from Tarkov or other military simulators really appreciate the very realistic mechanics put into the game by CIG. I myself have had a ton of fun running clear missions here at Security Post Korea. So if light combat really isn't your thing, there's always the choice of becoming a marine or bounty hunter that really focuses more on ground combat than space combat. If blowing other people up in your internet spaceship though is the thing that you want to do, well then I wouldn't worry too much. The current iteration of that system is probably the most polished, though they're still obviously working on it and tweaking it as they add more ships and weapons. The new aerodynamic flight system will also be coming into the game around sometime next year, quarter one or quarter two which will make aerodynamic ships behave much better in atmosphere nebula than their brick-like counterparts. Wondering though if your PC can actually handle it? Well, lucky you, in 3.3.6, they added a new tool called telemetry that you can find here on the website by going to development and telemetry. This tool shows you pretty clearly what people are experiencing with various systems across the board. For example, here in the lower left, we'll see the minimum specification, which is currently yielding around 41.3 FPS with an AMD 8350 and a GTX 1060. It's very likely you'll be able to find your own system somewhere on this chart, but I have to warn you that you should only take this information with a grain of salt, as it does not tell you what frequency the RAM is at, where they have the installation because an SSD makes a huge huge difference in performance, and it doesn't tell you the internet connection because that too will have an impact on your performance in the game. Overclocking your CPU will also yield a pretty good jump in FPS, so it's hard to tell in this chart whether or not those people are overclocking. All I can tell you is that if you're looking to get into the game, that this is a really good way to see what at minimum you're probably going to get. Of course, in the future, these numbers will also all go up. If you look at 2.6 or even 3.0, you'll see that those numbers were pretty abysmal. So there has been a substantial improvement this past year in performance, and I expect to see even more as more and more improvements are made to the OCS system. Inevitably though, many of you are going to be looking to upgrade your rigs sometime this year and so you're probably wondering what you should upgrade first. Well, in order, I would suggest first an SSD for the install. That's going to increase your performance. Second, I would suggest getting a new CPU like the 9900K along with its MOBO and respective RAM. It's going to give you much more price per dollar performance than a 2080 Ti or any of the 20 series will. After you've got a new CPU, then upgrade your GPU. 
because at present, getting a new 2080 Ti costs roughly the same as getting a 9900K, the cooler that comes with it, a MOBO, and even some sticks of RAM. Yeah, they're that overpriced. The CPU, regardless of future performance improvements, will always play a big role in the way Star Citizen performs because of the way OCS works. Right now, single-threaded performance and multiple threads are important for Star Citizen, but as the game progresses further, I suspect that having more threads is going to give you more of an increase in performance than single core frequency. So I hope that helps a lot of you guys out wondering if your computer can run it. I'm sure some of you are quite surprised to find that you actually don't need an incredibly beefy computer to get a good 50 FPS to 60 FPS in the game. So at this point in the video, hopefully you know whether or not Star Citizen is for you and whether or not your rig can run it. The final question to answer is, what level of pledge do you need to put forward of your own money for you to actually enjoy the experience? Honestly, you really only need the base starter package or maybe even the Avenger Titan that, that's a $60 package because Really, once you have a beginner package, you're going to be able to get into the game and play with friends. Or you can even hop onto the Armco community and borrow ships. You don't need to buy all of these ships and pledge all this money to be able to experience all the ships in the game. That's just something that you can do if you really feel like you want to support the cause. Pledges aren't actually buying ships. What you're doing is you're giving money to CIG to fund development, and in return, they're giving you a ship. Because in the end, these ships will not be purchasable when the game is released, and you will be able to buy any ship in the game in-game with in-game money. Now, of course, a lot of people will say, well, it's sort of like pay to win. It's like microtransactions. If you buy a bigger ship, you're going to be more powerful. And although that may be true, for example, uh, between uh, uh, a Titan Avenger versus a little Anvil Arrow, it's not true when you start scaling up much higher to, say, multi-crew ships. Because once you get more and more crew, it's more dependent on your crew's ability to perform than it was before. On the level of sub-capitals and carriers, it's even more more of an issue because those ships require somewhere around 15 to 20 people to really operate them efficiently, not really including the actual flight deck pilots. Then there's stuff like maintenance cost for when components or thrusters go bad. At present, even size 3 stuff can cost as much as 100k AUEC. So one person only running missions with a Kraken is going to go broke pretty much the first day. And that's why really big ships aren't really an advantage. They're more of a... <sighs> more of a problem. <laughs> Trust me, trying to herd a group of people over even 10 is like herding cats. It's ridiculous. And I know a lot of people have bought Idrises and Krakens and stuff and Javelins, but I highly suspect that the vast majority of them will stay in dry dock the majority of the time because there simply aren't enough people to man them for their guilds. So guys, moral of the story here is that you really don't need a big package to have fun. You just need to be able to get into the game and pledge for it. So starting with an Aurora or a Mustang is fine. If you want to get a little bit bigger, go up to the Avenger for a single fighter. It gives you a bed to sleep in and a place to store cargo. The Titan is my personal recommendation. Finally, if you've got a friend or two that you want to play with, or maybe even three friends, then a Freelancer or a, a Drake Cutlass is a great first step multi-crew ship that's not going to cost a lot of money and is easily crewed by your friends. Only spend a lot more than that if you're really into the project like myself. Personally, I've been waiting for a game since Star Wars Galaxies to really get me back into MMOs, and really this is the only game that has been as ambitious as that real game. I mean, even today, we really don't have games where you can fully customize the interior of our house, go and find unlimited amounts of custom clothing or weapons manufactured by individual players, fly into space in real time and man big ships with your friends. All that was present years and years ago and has just dropped off the radar for science fiction games. That's why I'm backing and that's why I was willing to give them so much because I really believe in this project. And it's up to you whether or not you will too. If you do end up backing though, make sure you use my referral code which will give you 5,000 extra UEC when you start the game and helps me and my big guild get a javelin sometime in the future. 
Anyway, guys, I hope this has helped answer a lot of your basic questions about Star Citizen. If you have any more, let me know down in the comments section below. I really do read that stuff. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope to see you guys next time.